Any other thoughts from the panel? Yes, Dave. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, I'll be brief in my comments, but you know what? What you guys do is wonderful, wonderful work. It's really outstanding in every way. But we, there was an old adage many years ago in the Farmer's Almanac that said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And, and once people have a, a disease process um, that requires intervention, then it's going to be expensive. What we, try to, what we need to try to figure out is how do we then focus on primary care prevention and wellness as alternatives. Once people are ill, then you have to do what you need to do. But what can we do as a society uh, to focus on those issues before they get that ill? Uh, you know, we spend a lot, of, a lot of money on taking care of individuals that come in with very significant um, problems and or disease processes. But the question we keep asking ourselves is what, what should we have done for this individual to prevent them to get to this point? Uh, so I think we're going to have to really focus on, on those as priorities. You know, if, you know, I've said many times before, what if 100 years ago um, the, the reimbursement system had been set up so that all providers, hospitals, and doctors got paid for keeping people well and got paid nothing when they were ill? Would things be different today? I think they would. So I believe we need to get back to basics. Uh, we need to get back to prevention and try to identify problems before they get very expensive. And one of the things the reform bill does not address um, is our personal accountability for our health. We need to talk about those issues at some point, but I believe that the best way to approach the cost curve, or to bend the cost curve, if you will, is to focus on not getting people to that point where they need intervention. David. Uh, limiting my comments to the acute care setting for the moment, uh, but acknowledging and, and agreeing with the things that, uh, that David has said about the pre-hospital environment, uh, most of you will be aware that that St. Luke's Episcopal uh, Hospital uh, is a house that was built by cardiology and cardiac surgery. And uh, <coughs> one of our ongoing uh, opportunities is to try to channel the many, many practitioners uh, in those uh, broad specialties uh, into increasingly predefined pathways. So standardization. Uh, since the beginning of my career uh, at the University of California uh, Hospital in San Francisco, so many objections to this standardization approach uh, have been uh, put forward, starting with it's bad for graduate medical education, uh, that we have to have people who experiment with different approaches, uh, learning from uh, their errors as uh, uh, most have in the most hallowed forms of medical training over, over the many years. But uh, today, uh, when the inpatient environment uh, is faced with the kind of changes that are in front of us, which I'm sure we'll be addressing in more depth in, in, in following questions, uh, becoming a focused factory is very, very important. Now, uh, uh, not being a physician myself, I recognize uh, as I talk to people about the philosophical transformation that's necessary to standardize, it becomes always clear <coughs> that this is about the last reason a person has chosen medicine as a profession. And that that career selection has been driven by a belief that there would be a maximum opportunity for personal professional autonomy. Uh, and I think our society supported that for a very long time, uh, but it's fairly likely through the economic hand of the government uh, to be quickly followed by uh, private uh, initiatives in the insurance sector that those degrees of freedom uh, are not going to be supported going forward. So. If one uh, accepts the change in the paradigm, uh, I think the, the process standardization, uh, getting to consensus in a given uh, cardiology service or a, a cardiac surgery service as to what's going to be done at what time, under what indications, 
uh, is really very, very important. And, and this is quite old business, I think, for the most closely integrated systems, but it's quite new business, relatively speaking, for institutions like, like my own that have been built on top of independent private practice. Mark, as a CEO as well as a physician, how do you see other opportunities? We talked about uh, prevention. We talked about education for our generations, even including ourselves. I mean, do you really know what, what is the cost of a certain procedure? I mean, most people don't know, have no idea, no earthly clue. And uh, there's quite a bit of variation from one hospital to another. And we talked about standardization. Uh, of maybe an approach, a guideline, and we'll talk about that, Ralph, also. But Mark, from your perspective, how do you see another way for us to, to look at that? I think uh, you touched on some of that just in your remarks now, but physicians and hospitals have to lead this effort. You know, we, the government solutions, the managed care solutions are ultimately not going to bend the cost curve. They're not going to result in more cost-effective care. I think when we, the people who are at the front lines taking care of patients, focus on the best things for those patients. We can focus on quality and outcomes, but also cost as part of that. And so that triple aim is incredibly important because, you know, certainly when I was trained, cost never came into the equation whatsoever in anything. Probably one single lecture I had in medical school or residency or anything else after that. And, and I think that, that frame shift, that mindset that we as clinicians, we as leaders of hospital systems have to focus on the cost part of the equation as well. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So we've been trained in this mindset. You go into the room with the patient and you're focused on that patient only right there. And uh, I still agree with that. But if you carry that to its extreme, that means you're going to do everything under the sun for that patient. Where, uh, you know, when we start thinking a little bit more on a population basis, you're gonna recognize that if we don't focus on the cost side, when you spend a bunch of money here on patient A or thousand patients like patient A, you don't have the money to spend on the thousand patients like patient B. And so how we get our heads around that I think is going to be a, a major societal shift for us because it's, it's not the way uh, that we've all focused on that. Um, I think we need to start right at the beginning with the educational system and we need to work with our, our you know, upcoming medical students uh, on you know, how do you look at cost effectiveness. We need to be teaching them and giving them the tools to understand that. You know, we do a terrible job. Right now, I mean, I, I have an IT system here. You know, why doesn't my IT system, when, when you pull up the list of drugs, say, you know, when this one costs 50 cents and this one costs $50? The clinician actually might take an extra second there to think, which one's a little better? Well, guess what, we just saved $49.50 if they make that judgment call that there's not really a meaningful difference in those drugs versus just simple prescribing habits that we would normally see. So it's, it's a multifaceted approach, I think, that we have to move that, that kind of cost consideration into what we do. Ralph, uh, <laughs> your perspective in, in different ways, obviously Ralph chaired or was an instrumental, certainly, in, in the appropriateness use criteria from the college perspective, from the American College of Cardiology, uh, is in a, an integrated system how do you perceive this, Keep in maintaining quality in mind, but looking at that portion of value, which is cost? Well, thanks, Bill. Before I, I offer my comments, I wanted to thank you, Bill, uh, from the American College of Cardiology and having us down here, and also Mark and, and all the people at Methodist for the incredible tour that we got of your great facility. Uh, we really enjoyed the visit. and. The leadership of the college uh, really appreciates being with all of you today, so thank you so much. You know, um, uh, <coughs> Don Berwick talks, of course, about the triple aim, and he mentions how at least 30 percent of waste is in the system. And uh, the challenges that we learned earlier today, listening to Mark, is how we understand where the end of game is, where the goal may be, in terms of revamping. Uh, uh, how we actually uh, reimburse, trying to go to a system that truly is based on quality while presently we're on quantity, and how we have to get prepared in dealing with that during that transition. People talk about accountable care organizations, for example, and is this really a rationing thing, or is, can we achieve the 
bending the cost curve through getting rid of uh, inefficiency and, and waste. Uh, comments were made earlier about uh, management within the acute care hospitals, and we heard earlier today, for example, Methodist's approach in terms of decreasing sepsis and other effective tools. Interestingly, when you talk to Carolyn Clancy, this has been a number one problem from the Agency of Health Research and Quality. All of their efforts in trying to decrease uh, never events have not been incorporated in our nation's hospitals like some of the things that would be de done here. Obviously, that has bad results for the patients and obviously increased costs, and just dealing with that would save a lot of money. Uh, Great comments were made about the training system. I think we have a huge problem here because the way we train our residents and fellows is we, we do imaging, we teach tests, we, the way we, we have to order more tests for them to understand that learning, but we don't incorporate appropriate criteria. So as they leave the education system, they're not really trained to, with which to do such. And those comments are great that we need this training paradox to incorporate how to be, best order. And we need to identify our variations of care because that's really where we need to go in terms of being able to decrease uh, a wastage in use. And to first do that, we have to measure what we're doing to be able to identify those variations. And then, you know, thanks for the plug about the appropriate use criteria, but that may be at least one of the mechanisms that we have to try to eliminate unneeded testing. Now, I will say about the appropriate use criteria related to imaging and revascularization is that the college, uh, although is proud of this en endeavor, also appreciates that it's in its awkward adolescence. In other words, we have to show to ourselves that this application of this tool doesn't have any negative unintended consequences, and also we got to show that clinical outcomes uh, remain good. And the last comment is the issue of shared decision making because uh, there's been a lot of research that when you actively involve patients and families in shared decision making, which I don't think we adequately do in the United States, when adequately informed, oftentimes patients and families, particularly in the elderly, may choose less costly options and more conservative options. These are great comments, uh, Ralph, and, and all of you. Um, you mentioned there a shift from maybe in a payment models. Let, let's talk a little about payment models because I think they're very important there. The current payment model is fee-for-service, although if, if you look at, oh, we have quite a bit of variety. I know we have the chief of cardiology from the VA hospital. Uh, believe it or not, this country, in this country, we have all payment models that are thought of almost in the world of how to provide care. You have some entitlement programs like Medicare and Medicaid. You have the VA system which, you know, within a budget you provide the care. You have the fee-for-service model, which is the predominant one throughout. And uh, you have self-pay for individuals who are, you know, uninsured who still have to, to pay. So we have basically all these various payment models. And while shifting in principle from a volume, meaning the more I do, the more I get or at least sustain myself, or whatever it is, be it for hospitals or be it for, for physicians, while shifting from this model to something that would look at quality and outcome as opposed to the volume of care, we have tremendous challenges. I know most likely, I think we will see this, most likely this team of, of healthcare experts there think that this is the future. I don't know whether it will be an all or none phenomenon, most likely a kind of hybrid kind of situation. But at the same time, I think the panelists, I'd like them to, to relay the challenges that we have while transitioning from one system to another. Transitioning from one system where this is how you make your livelihood to saying I'm going to use much less and therefore I decrease my income and maybe my livelihood to this other system <coughs> poses challenges. So the question to the team here is how do you see this play out 
keeping in mind that I don't know what the you know, uh, Accountable Care Act will, will ultimately uh, hold to after June or whatever it is or with elections. But let, let's keep this at least off the radar screen and think of if really we want to move into this kind of healthcare system where we reward health, we reward outcome, uh, yet at the same time we have to make sure that we are sustainable as healthcare professionals in addition to hospitals. How do, we, how do you guys see this moving in a practicality point of view? Is this a gradual thing? Uh, how do you see this from a practical point of view? Because as we push appropriateness use criteria and quality and decrease utilization, uh, we're going to have screams from this audience and others. Well, let me, let me, uh, let me start by saying I, I really am not looking forward to this. It scares the heck out of me. <laughs> you know, it will not be fun. Um, you know, there's only 30 hours in a day. We've got to make the most of them. What scares me is what's being proposed in the reform bill, which is called bundle payments. I think it's ridiculous, it's absurd, it's silly, it's crazy, I don't like it, but you know what, at some point, we may have to do that. And once we're in the same room trying to figure out how to make this thing work, this will not work unless you have our medical staff buy into the concept. You know what, we, we ought to have a 10-minute pity party and say we don't like it. And after that, we suck it up and we say, all right, how are we gonna do this? And, and, and what we need to do is focus on quality. If you focus on quality, then costs will come down. But, but I think what's gonna happen is that once we are put into that environment where we have to figure out how we're gonna do that, and, and quite honestly, the rules have not been written for how to do that just yet. It's a, it's a theory that has a lot of problems with it, if you will. But if we get to the point where we are told, here's your, here's your dollar amount, you figure out who's gonna get how much, that's gonna be a not a fun meeting. I think we'll probably have to use Foley catheters for people who don't wanna leave the room. Uh, when that dis discussion is being discussed about who's going to get how much. But I think once we get to that point, we're in the same boat. Uh, we've had in the past, as you know, we've had denials of admissions for hospitals um, and physicians get paid. Uh, so I think once we're in the same boat with the same challenges, um, then we will really uh, do this the right way. Now, is there room for opportunity? Yes, there's room for opportunity. My fear is that we'll go so far in the other direction that we're going to hurt patient care. That's a real potential unless we do it the right way. So I think the, the bundle payment idea, I think within five years, it'll either take legs or it's going to die. Do I think the reform bill is going to get overturned entirely? No. Portions of it may be, but I don't believe the bundle payment issue is being discussed or reviewed. But I, I think once we get into the same boat with the same, um, I guess, vested interest, then we'll do the right thing because we always have. So providing the right care and the right quantities at the right time and the right setting becomes a critical uh, path for us to address. We have two Davids on the opposite ends of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> David. Okay, so uh, my comment uh, is really intended to be uh, particularly provocative, um, but, not, but not representing either Republican or Democrat philosophy, really. <clears throat> I personally believe, and so having been through uh, the great sign curve of regulatory efforts in American medicine since uh, about 1973, uh, we forget quickly that a lot of the things in the so-called Obama plan started in the Nixon administration. So at one time, they were sort of good Republican politics, and now they've become sort of the third rail uh, for the Republican uh, congressional uh, contingents. And I, I actually believe that much of the discussion about accountable care, individual mandate, bundling, is really just a policy question on the fringe of the question that our government and the learned profession in medicine uh, have been constitutionally unable to really address. Uh, and I would frame it something like this. We all hear over and over how the percentage of gross domestic product in the United States 
is twice or more that of other Western economies who are achieving twice the good results with half the money in terms of uh, quality adjusted life years and, and, uh, uh, and good health, if you will. But what is much less discussed is that this critical difference in national <coughs> expenditure doesn't really separate in these same Western countries until about age 60. I mean, France, Germany, England, the United States, more or less until age 60 are spending, give or take, <coughs> the same proportion of their GDP. Our expert health economist can call me out if necessary. <laughs> but after She's that, that <laughs> our curve looks like this. I mean, it's like a launch to the moon. So the question, the policy question from my standpoint is what is the social contract going to be in our country? <coughs> now, of course, the moment in the, in the, in the public policy debate uh, that ended up being the Affordable Care uh, Act and law, that the notion of a granny commission was sort of whispered in the dead of night, uh, where nobody thought a single ear could possibly hear, but there must have been a member of the press in the alley. Uh, this is the third rail of politics. I mean, nobody can go there. Uh, we have today at <clears throat> St. Luke's uh, next door, a really, really wonderful uh, elderly uh, woman, uh, about 86 years of age. I know I can't give you too many identifiers here, so I'm going to be very careful. Uh, who had a wonderful intervention to all evidence, hugely successful last week uh, by one of our most accomplished cardiovascular surgeons. Uh, and I think has a reasonably good chance of, uh, of full recovery. And I mean, if the statistics uh, are on her side, I mean, two, three, four, five years of, of life ahead of her that would not have existed absent this intervention. But I don't think this procedure would have been done in any of the other countries I've named. <coughs> And so I think it's really the social contract that's central that nobody is really prepared to address. I mean, there's, there's uh, a lot of literature. <coughs> I mean, I, I assume you see some of it in, in, in your professional publications, but uh, if not, come over to the health policy literature now and again and see how many Medicare beneficiaries have a surgical intervention in the last six months of life. Now, the people who are undertaking these procedures are well-educated. Many are sitting in this room and probably have a pretty good prognosis when they undertake this under our current social convention, which is everything for everyone. And so I don't I don't personally think until the nation matures enough and the learned professions guide government sufficiently that the core of this cost equation can really be overcome. Because I don't think bundled payments really, which will promote uh, a lot of polite and not so polite haggling between physicians and, and healthcare care executives uh, or insurance uh, organizations and, uh, and hospitals uh, uh, or whether or not you're employed or, or, or not. I just think those, to my way of thinking, are honestly peripheral to this central question of, of what is the social covenant going to be. I think, David, you, you put it very nicely. Obviously, it touches on a very essential part of, uh, of care, at least in the United States, and its implications regarding cost. 
and at times you could even towards the very, very end of life, and I know in all of our hospitals and other facilities, you just start wondering about the element of futility very late, late on in life. And I think this is a societal thing that I think our society hasn't really addressed, and I, I fully agree with you. This is part of that equation.